Thank you, Yvonne. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to AIMS Research Center. We're delighted to have you here. Um, our center director, Pete Redden, is back at uh, NASA headquarters this morning attending a meeting that uh, he had to attend. Um, and so on behalf of AIMS, I, I wanted to welcome you all today. Um, I, I want to thank, I want to begin by thanking a couple of key people. Uh, no new enterprise can be successful without sponsors and champions. Um, and NASA headquarters has provided a couple of those champions for us and for the NRSI. So I want to particularly thank Jim Green, who apparently is stuck in traffic. Jim, of course, is the Division Chief of Planetary Sciences and in the Science Mission Directorate at headquarters, and he should be joining us shortly. And Mike Wargo, who is the Chief Scientist for the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. Uh, and Mike will be joining us remotely. Uh, as you can see. Um, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of things about NRSI. Um, NRSI is the middle child of three of our remote uh, virtual institutes here at Ames. Uh, the first one, of course, our eldest child, is the NASA Astrobiology Institute located here, headquartered here at Ames, uh, which was a very successful model uh, for virtual institutes and sort of broke new territory and was a pathfinder for this kind of an enterprise. Uh, followed uh, in 2008 and, and, and early 2009 um, by the NRSI, of which you are all part of. And most recently, just a, a couple of months ago, uh, we established our third institute here, uh, thanks to the support of NASA headquarters, the NASA uh, Aeronautics Institute. So now we are the home for NASA's three virtual institutes, and I think this is proving to be an extremely successful model. So how do we measure success? What are the metrics for success for an enterprise like this, and in particular, NLSI? Well, I think there are a few things that we can point to that demonstrate the success of NLSI, even in its four short years, really three, about three short years of, of activity. First is scientific productivity and breakthrough new findings. And you're going to be hearing a lot of that uh, in the next day or two. Uh, and I think uh, it's a testimony to the vigor and the vitality of this particular scientific community. Second is the interactions, the collaboration, and the community that this virtual institute and other virtual institutes have served to create. And I think the NLSI, led by Yvonne and her, her team, really have done a wonderful job of pulling this community together and creating a really cohesive scientific enterprise worldwide. Um, and third, of course, is bringing in new students, because that is the next generation, and that is the future of any particular scientific endeavor. And NLSI has been extremely successful in captivating the interest and the enthusiasm of young people. And I, as I look in the audience here, I can see many, many young faces, and, and welcome to this particular intellectual and academic and scientific enterprise. Uh, we look forward to your discoveries and your contributions in the future. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to, uh, to Mike and let him continue some uh, opening remarks. Um, and again, thank you for, all, uh, for, for coming and participating in this event, and I hope you have an extremely productive and, um, and satisfying meeting. Thank you. Planning our future exploration of, uh, of the solar system and 
doing that stuff. Uh, you, you probably heard a number of times when Jim Green has said, hey, when these guys from human exploration go exploring, they're taking science with them. That's exactly the case. And we have, of course, uh, the great example of lunar reconnaissance orbiter. It uh, looks like it's the Energizer Bunny of lunar exploration. It keeps going and going. It's now in a front of the orbit doing uh, a, a great job. You're going to hear an awful lot of the new results from LRO coming through. And while those are science results from the science portion of the mission, they're also having an impact on our future planning of um, for human missions uh, for explore beyond lower world. Uh, and of course, we now have uh, the rail mission, and rail, in a lot of ways, is a mirror image of, of LRO. It's a science mission, uh, but it is already providing information and results that are being requested by our mission planning folks for uh, our ongoing planning activities for uh, lunar exploration. And we're working with uh, Maria and her team to uh, ensure that we get the, uh, the data in a, in a timely manner so that uh, we're able to use it in our ongoing planning activities. The other thing I think to, uh, to point out is to keep an eye on the results from the teams of the Lunar Science Institute. Of course, it's going to be great science. You, you, you all expect that, and, and we've seen uh, ample uh, examples of that in the past. But also recognize that the work that they're doing and the problems that they're, they're working on has direct alignment with the planning activities that uh, we have in, in human exploration and operations. And now, a little bit of homework. If you guys haven't already heard, you're about to learn a new acronym. And that's SKG for Strategic Knowledge Gap. That Strategic Knowledge Gap formalism is what human exploration and operations is doing to identify the stuff we need to know, the measurements we need to make, and the tests we need to run in order to be able to explore safely, effectively, efficiently at the moon, at asteroids, and at Mars. And those strategic knowledge gaps are going to be the basis for our investment strategy of how human exploration and operations uh, looks to fill those strategic knowledge gaps. And of course, the Institute, as well as other activities that we have, are going to play a major role in how we fill those strategic and the lunar science community has already made a, uh, a substantial contribution and impact to this, particularly through the Lunar Exploration Analysis Group. And uh, we have uh, a, a strong commitment from uh, that's been made by uh, Clive Neal and Chip Shearer, that where they put together a specific action team that identified early on working with NASA uh, those strategic knowledge gaps for lunar exploration. And they're now, even yesterday, that team was working, tying them back into the lunar exploration roadmap that LEAP has been evolving over the last few years. That's enough about strategic knowledge gaps for now, but that, think of this as only a preview, because this afternoon for NASA night, uh, I'm going to be giving you more detail on that and give you an opportunity to ask some questions with respect to that, and particularly how you can be involved in uh, helping us uh, move forward with our ongoing planning for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And with that, uh, I had some notes here to make sure that these didn't turn into Mike Wargo minutes. And uh, at this stage, let me turn things back over to Yvonne, and hopefully Jim will be out of traffic.
Good morning. I'll make my comments very brief, and um, I want to say a couple of things that are actually pretty obvious. You know, several years ago when we started the Institute and we really started to work together with exploration, um, we didn't really have much of a lunar program, but since then with MCUBE, uh, with LRO, and LRO, by the way, went through the senior review, and I'll say it went very well, and we're analyzing those results now, so congratulations to the, to, um, to the LRO team for doing such a great job on the proposal. GRAIL now is in an extended mission. Artemis is flying by the moon often, and we still have um, uh, LADI uh, upcoming. And so uh, this is a really a great time. Everything that we wanted to do by working with exploration, we've been uh, accomplishing in a very um, a methodical way. Uh, and uh, it's going to evolve, and we'll hear more about it uh, tonight at NASA Night. But I wanted to congratulate everyone uh, for the major work and major emphasis in bringing back a lunar community that is important to the science that we do. Really puts, I think, the moon in perspective as it has needed to be for many, many years. So once again, I'm delighted to, to be here uh, at the conference, and I'll turn it back over to Yvonne. Thank you all so much. So we have a few comments uh, now to share with you. Uh, some are logistics, but some are more philosophical. It is my pleasure to stand before you as the director of the NASA Lunar Science Institute and tell you that these past two years have been a real learning experience for me as well as many of you. And what I've learned working with this fabulous team that I have together, uh, that both the um, seven uh, national teams that we have, our seven international partners, and our fantastic staff here at the central office, is that the virtual institute concept really works. It really gives more. The whole is more than uh, the sum of the parts. And it is demonstrated every day to me in many ways. The executive summary booklet that you all got as you registered today is a resource that demonstrates in short form what our teams have done over the first three years of their activity. It is that kind of research coupled with the virtual meetings that we have on a monthly basis, sometimes every other week, with many of you, where we reach beyond our teams to include the entire lunar science community. And in addition to those virtual meetings, we have this, our face-to-face -face forum that is so important to every single one of us that brings over 500 people together every year, this year for three full days, and at least 100 students, maybe more, at least 100 people from other countries, and we share lunar science and our excitement for that, science and exploration, over the course of these three days. This forum will be live streamed for the first time. So anyone who couldn't make it here because of travel restrictions should be able to watch anyway. Now, if you're a presenter and that gives you some concern, please let us know. We will not stream any talks that you would like to keep uh, off of the internet. I'd also like to thank the Scientific Organizing Committee, which has just done a fantastic job putting together this program. And in particular, the chair of that, Dr. Jennifer Heldman, who I believe is here somewhere in the back of the room, there she is. Could we please give her a big round of applause? I would also like to thank our local organizing committee. And that was shepherded by our supreme shepherdess and my chief of staff, Shirley Berthold. Shirley is not in the room, but let's give her a hand anyway. You will see many of the central staff members throughout the course of the three days. Uh, tomorrow, they will be wearing bright red t-shirts that didn't show up on time today. But uh, when you see those red t-shirts, and hopefully even before if you need them, please go up and ask for anything that we can help you with. Now, for those of you only attending for the first time, you won't know this. But the rest of you know both our venue and our menu have changed. We apologize for any inconvenience this is going to cause, but I want you all to concentrate, instead of the frustration of change, because it's 
hard to adjust to change. Concentrate instead on what you're getting. You're getting to share the great science and exploration insights that you're going to learn over the next three days. I hope that that will counterbalance any frustration you may have. But that said, buy your lunch tickets early, please. We need to have everybody who is going to pick up a box lunch do so, purchase your ticket, and buy your lunch by 10.30. We got an extension on that, so by 10.30 this morning, so that our cafeteria can have those ready for you. The reason we really want you to do that is not just so that you can eat lunch, but so that you can eat lunch and join one of the focus groups. As you know, the focus groups are the way that our NLSI teams connect with our community in such a vibrant way. And we're considering a new discretionary fund for the focus groups. If we can find and carve out just a little bit of money to help the focus groups, and I'd like you all to think about that as you're in your focus groups today and tomorrow, what is it that those groups need that would actually advance the field in some way or bring the community closer together? So there are all kinds of reasons for you to go to these focus groups. Pick one, sign up, show up, hopefully with your lunch so you won't be hungry. Any food that you have available here, you are going to have to purchase. This is a result of the new changes in government conference constraints. And I'm sure you're seeing this all over. Many meetings are actually being canceled. We are so grateful that we're able to have this meeting here today. And I'd like to say that it's because my deputy, Greg Schmidt, led a team that waded through all of the changes and figured out how we could fit and become one of those few conferences that were exempt and able to happen. So I'd like to give a round of applause to Greg. You have no idea how hard that was. Okay, maybe a couple of you do. All right. Uh, now, that said, you're going to see just a couple of free snacks at the poster session, and I want you to know that not a single government dollar was injured in the purchase of those snacks. Okay. Those were personally purchased by your very highly paid director and deputy director. Okay. <laughs> and, and the only reason I'm saying that is because perception is the biggest part of the problem here, and we don't want anyone to go away thinking that you got those chips and salsa on the government uh, dollar. Okay. Highlights. We have a lot of highlights during this forum. The NASA night that's going to happen this afternoon uh, with Jim Green and Mike Wargo is going to be the place where you're going to get every single question answered that you ever wanted to know about anything NASA does. Isn't that right? <laughs> okay, well come anyway, you'll learn something. Also on Thursday, I'm so pleased that John Grunsfeld and Bill Gerstenmeier are jointly giving a talk to this audience. This is demonstrating at the next level what Mike Wargo and Jim Green have shown us for years that human exploration and science go hand in hand. Science enables exploration, and exploration enables science. So I'm very excited about that. And this year, we're bringing back the lightning round talk. Last year, you told us in an overwhelming voice that this was one of the most successful aspects of our forum. The lightning round talks, these are very short, minute and a half talks by students who are very nervous about doing this. But they're going to get up here in front of you, and they're going to tell you who they are, where they're from, what they're studying, and how you can find them at their poster. So please stay for that and encourage them. This is the next generation, and we're so happy to have them. The way forward. I believe with all my heart the way forward is filled with opportunity for this institute, for NASA, and for science in general. I know you're frustrated, you would like to hear announcements, we would like to tell you things that you're probably going to be a little frustrated by if you're not hearing them at this meeting. I urge you to be patient. We're, we're putting together a foundation for the long term. You are going to end up with an institute that I believe is going to last many, many years into the future. So 
please be patient. Please stay with us. We have got a lot of good science and good exploration to do together. With that, I'm now going to introduce my deputy director, Greg Schmidt, a Renaissance man, if I've ever seen one. He gets the job done when no one else can. He brings together and builds communities. His many years of experience in both the science and engineering side of what NASA does has served him so well. And there is no one more appropriate to explain to you what the NASA Lunar Science Institute Shoemaker Award is about, why it's given, and who our outstanding recipient is this year. Please join me in welcoming Greg Schmidt. Thanks, Yvonne, and, and a warm welcome from me as well to uh, all of you. It's so great to see uh, some new faces and all the uh, familiar ones from the past years. Um, my name is Greg Schmidt. I'm the Deputy Director of the NASA Lunar Science Institute, as you've just heard, and it really gives me a lot of pleasure this morning to give an introduction to Dr. Stuart Ross Taylor, who is the winner of the 2012 Shoemaker Distinguished Lunar Scientist Medal. Although Dr. Taylor wasn't able to travel from his home in Australia here to California to receive this medal in person, he's both gracious, graciously accepted it and recorded a lecture which we're going to be viewing shortly. The Shoemaker Distinguished Lunar Scientist Medal is an annual award given to a scientist who has significantly contributed to the field of lunar science throughout the course of their scientific career. The award includes a medal which I have an example of uh, right here, with a Shakespearean quote, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with the night. The first Distinguished Lunar Scientist Award was given posthumously to Gene Shoemaker himself and presented last year to his wife, Carolyn Shoemaker. As a small synopsis of the work for which he is honored today, Dr. Taylor has worked on the composition and evolution of the moon, the continental crust, tectites and impact glasses, island arc rocks, and many other topics involving trace element geochemistry. He has published 240 papers in scientific journals, as well as nine books, many of which uh, you're no doubt familiar with here. Ross has been awarded the Goldschmidt Medal of the Geochemical Society, the Leonard Medal of the Meteoritical Society, the Butcher Medal and the Bowen Award of the American Geophysical Union, and the Gilbert Award of the Geological Society of America. Asteroid 5670 is named Ross Taylor. The letter Yvonne and I wrote to Dr. Taylor bestowing this award on him concludes, on behalf of the entire NASA Lunar Science Institute and community, it is with the greatest pleasure that we present you with this, the Shoemaker Distinguished Lunar Scientist Award. You bring honor and distinction to the field of lunar science. We thank you for your dedication and achievement and for providing an example of the excellence to which we as a community aspire. Without further ado, I'd like to present Dr. Taylor's 2012 Shoemaker Lecture. And although he's not here in person uh, to hear it, let's please give a warm round of applause to the winner of this year's Shoemaker Medal. Thank you. Um, well, first let me say how honored I am to receive this Shoemaker Award from the NASA Lunar Science Institute. Uh, and I apologize for being unable to be present. Uh, Jean and Carolyn were particularly good friends of ours and often stayed with us in Canberra during their many trips to Australia, which ended so tragically. But Jean, of course, was responsible for the uh, mapping the Barringer Crater and determining that it was due to meteorite impact. This was contrary to the popular impression at the time and uh, led to the, his ability to map the lunar craters as due to impact, not due to volcanism, which was very popular. Uh, Gene also made a substantial contribution uh, because he understood what he was looking at on the moon, contrary to many other people in the 60s. The literature in the 60s was full of extraordinary papers about what we were going to find on the moon and what the lunar surface meant. 
And Jean actually and Don Willems understood this very well and were able to map the moon and, uh, and make the stratigraphic time scale, which dates from 1962 and is still valid, although the numbers on it, of course, come from the Apollo missions radiometric dating. Now, when you give a talk like this, the, uh, you have various options. One is to indulge in reminiscences about the Apollo missions. The other is to make some comments of probably more interest to the current audience. And there have been two very successful missions to uh, both to Mercury and to Vesta. The messenger mission to Ber Mercury and the Dawn mission to Vesta. And the Mercury mission revealed the astounding fact that Mercury has about the same volatile level of abundance as Mars. And this was totally unexpected. Everyone expected Mercury to be completely depleted in volatile elements. Well, we need to go back a bit to Planetology 101. Uh, and this, of course, is the material in the, from which the Sun and the planets were made. This is the composition of the original solar nebula. And the 2% figure for metals uh, has to be revised down to 1.4% as the oxygen abundance has decreased. Um, and uh, it, this is, shows the difficulties of what, uh, in dealing with planets as opposed to stars. The left-hand uh, circle shows pretty much what stars are made of, uh, mostly gas and various amounts of metals. Uh, very, never exceeding about 4%. But planets are made of any mixture of rock, ices, uh, and gas. And this is what makes the subject difficult. Uh, but we are fortunate to know the composition of the rocky fraction, another slide from Planetology 101. Uh, this is the famous correlation between the solar abundances and the meteorite C1 carbonaceous chondrite abundances. And it shows the very good match, except for lithium, which is consumed in nuclear reactions in the sun. So we know what the dust fraction is made of. However, planets are not made of this. And making planets, this is a, a slide, this is a comment from Stephen Soter uh, showing what a messy business it is to make planets. Uh, and it's a very good description of making, making rocky planets in particular. And this is a standard model derived from our own solar system of how the planets, how planets are formed. Uh, as the sun lights up, uh, there are strong stellar winds which drive out material to a snow line about three, somewhere between three and five AU. And uh, beyond that, there are 445 Earth masses of material, gases, ices, and dust. And on the sunward side, there are about two uh, earth masses of dry, rocky rubble for which we make the rocky or terrestrial planets. And this is a fairly low temperature business. Uh, this is a well-known slide from Minia Humayun and Bob Clayton uh, back in 1995, showing that, the, that there's been no variation in potassium isotopes during the formation of the various bodies which are plotted along on that curve. The curve shows the expected enrichment for, in potassium-41, the heavy isotope of potassium, if you evaporated starting at the C1 composition. And you can see by the time you get to the moon, you've lost 80 or 90 percent of the potassium. But there's been the, the bottom line with the, with the black dots shows the, the measured uh, abundances of the potassium isotopes, and there's absolutely no variation from one end to the other. Uh, it should be particularly noted that the EH and EM, uh, EL chondrites, the instantite chondrites, which are uh, highly reduced, show very little reduction in potassium, uh, in contrast to mercury, which I've put in this diagram, although we don't have isotopic abundances for it yet. Uh, and this uh, shows that the uh, that the, there were no there were no high temperature processes in the in the nebula except very close to the sun where the CIIs were formed, um, and uh, this of course accords with the astronomical measurements 
of uh, low temperatures around disks in around stars. And uh, there is a very good model by Chin Tzu Yin. Uh, this is the reference for it. Uh, and uh, which describes how this could come about at relatively low temperature conditions with, with stellar winds blowing away uh, the gas phase as the material from the interstellar medium drifts in, leaving the refractory grains, rocky refractory grains, in the inner nebula. And uh, he answers many of the questions of objections by geochemists to this model in, in this paper. Right. Well, this leads us to think a bit more about Mercury and its problems. Uh, the, standard, the problem with Mercury is, of course, the very high density, uh, as revealed, uh, as was known for a very long time. And um, the Mercury, the messenger mission to Mercury revealed that the core of Mercury occupies about 85% of its volume accounting for the very high density with a very thin mantle of about 400 kilometers. Uh, and there were two models to account for this. One that, one that there was high temperature evaporation of the mantle of Mercury which drove off the, drove off the rocky mantle and left the iron core. The second model is that due to Willie Bentz and Al Cameron that the med mer uh, Mercury was uh, hit by a very large body early in the, its history and lost large amounts of the, of the, uh, lost large amounts of the mantle, leaving the high density, uh, the high iron density. Moving on now to the moon, and this shows, of course, the, deple the depletion of volatile elements in the inner nebula relative, plotted here as potassium relative to uranium, and, uh, you see here the, the uh, value for Mars uh, and Mercury being about the same and very different from Vesta and the Moon and the Earth and Venus having somewhat intermediate losses of volatile elements. And the C1 chondrites, of course, represent the original composition of the solar nebula. Now the Turning to the Moon, since I'm addressing the NASA Lunar Science Institute, uh, the Moon and, and its series of problems. This is one of the best pictures of the Moon shown by the, uh, taken with a handheld camera on the Apollo 15 mission, showing Mary Ingenai and the round crater in the foreground is Thompson Crater, about 117 kilometers in diameter to give you a scale. And Gene and Don Willems understand the, understood exactly what they were looking at when they were mapping the moon and were able to, to explain. We now understand very clearly what formed this surface uh, and how it arose, and that's one of their great contributions. Well, the moon, of course, is depleted in volatile elements uh, by a factor of 50 relative to the Earth, according to data from Ed Anders a long time ago, and it has the same uh, depletion as the asteroid Vesta. This shows the depletion of the lunar uh, basalts plotted as crosses, uh, and the other points in the diagram are from U the, the Eucrite basalts from Vesta, which are um, showing that the depletion is very similar. And this has always been a puzzle to uh, geochemists because uh, Vesta, of course, we know that. Uh, from the Eucrite meteorites that Vesta was formed uh, very early, within a few million years of the beginning of the solar system. And uh, uh, yet it shows the same depletion of volatile elements as the moon. And so uh, we know that the abundance of volatile elements in Vesta is very close to that for the moon. We also know that the initial strontium ratios isotopic ratios, 87 to 86, uh, are very low in both Vesta and the Moon. Uh, and this, this is due, of course, to a loss of radioactive uh, rubidium, the volatile element, very early in Vesta, and presumably also very early on the Moon. 
So uh, the conclusions are that volatile elements are not particularly lost in collision. They're not; they don't seem to have been lost from Mercury, uh, and I would suggest they were not lost during the gigantic uh, lunar forming impact from the Moon. But the depletion in the volatile elements dates back to the beginning of the solar system, a hundred million years earlier, uh, and when the volatile elements were swept out in the early nebula at the beginning of the, as the sun lit up and the strong stellar winds began, at uh, effectively at T0. So, uh, well, of course, there are always more questions than answers when we're dealing with planets. And uh, amongst the questions I'd like to raise, are, are we really sure that the volatile element content on the Moon is lower than that on the Earth? Um, it's apparently 50 times lower. Um, but it depends on what rocks you're sampling. And then, of course, we have the interesting new information that the oxygen, chromium, silicon, and zirconium isotopes and others uh, have been homogenized in the collision. So this raises questions about whether the Moon is truly different in competition from the Earth. Um, and so uh, it raises another point that perhaps the, the water on the Earth uh, and the volatile elements came in in late collisions, as John Lenin and Morbidelli have suggested, uh, after the Moon formed, and they just missed the Moon and hit the Earth, uh, very much hit in the sphere, and showing, again, the random nature of planetary accretion. Well, I realize, I realize that at, at uh, NASA LSI there will be some exoplanet people sitting in the audience, so I thought I would just... Uh, mentioned to them that I have uh, published another book which is about to appear in September, A Destiny or Chance Revisited. Well, I hope you all enjoyed that. I think it was nice to hear from him. <laughs>